two is calculator. Now what that means is you're allowed to have a calculator out. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be helpful on every problem, okay? Because I did try to split the test up into two equal, you know, time-wise halves. Um, so this first one, for instance, um, you guys chose question number 103 right here, and it says, assume that f is a one-to-one -one function. Find f inverse and find the domain and range. Okay? So... This here was probably the hardest type of problem you had to find an inverse on. And that is what I'm putting on your test um, as well. But the first step in this was to take and change the f of x to y equals. And then after that, switch x and your y's. So we'd have x equals 7y plus 2 over 6y minus 5. And then next, you need to try to solve and get the y by itself. And that's what, um, you know, you're kind of stuck with here. You're like, wait a second, I've got y's in the numerator and y's in the denominator. You know, how can I get rid of those? And so what you would need to do is multiply by that denominator so that you can get the y out of the denominator. But whatever do you do to the right side, you have to do to the left side. Next, you would find yourself taking and distributing this. So you have 6xy minus 5x equals 7y plus 2. Now, you don't have any y's in the denominator, so you've taken care of that. But you still have a y on either side, and that's when you try to gather them together. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to subtract 7y from both sides. And I'm going to add this 5x because I only want the terms that have the y's over on this side. 6xy minus 7y equals, and then on this side, I have the 2 plus 5x or 5x plus 2. It does not matter the order you have that in. And now that you have the two terms with y's over here, you can take and factor a y out. Now I have eliminated the situation of two y's. I have it as a single y right here. And then it's being multiplied here by that 6x minus 7. So to get the y, I am so, I don't know what happened right there. Oh, wow. My board all of a sudden went off. Oh. All right, so dividing both sides by 6x minus 7. Uh-oh, we're having technical difficulties. Alright, divide both sides by 6x minus 7. On the left side, you have your y equals. And on the right side, 5x plus 2. Oh, no. <laughs> it kind of looks like that, huh? It's like it'll do it sometimes and not other. I don't know. Hopefully we can get through the recording, right? So we get y by itself, but what's the final thing we have to do? The final point, right? Change that y equals then to an f inverse. So f inverse of x, so that you're giving it as um, an inverse function. Okay, questions on that one? Again, if you want to do some more practice with it, remember you can always do the others that are on here. Okay. Yes. Oh, is that what you're asking no, too? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Just take the pass. Um, yes, you're right. This one says and find the domain and range um, of f. So here, the domain was pretty much given of f. Right? X. Oh, it's on the door. Sorry. So the domain of f, it said, domain of f 
right? Isn't that what it says? Find the domain of f. So we could say from there negative infinity to 5, 6 and 5, 6 to infinity. And then the range of f, well, um, a lot of these are negative infinity to positive infinity, but not necessarily. Sometimes there's an, a, a horizontal asymptote, which we haven't really talked about yet, but we will in the next chapter. And that's where your calculator could come in handy here, is to take and actually graph it and see what the range is. Um, the domain, you really want to look at that denominator of the equation. But since this is a fraction, I'm going to say alpha y equals... And then from there, type in my 7x uh, plus 2, and in the denominator, 6x and then minus 5. And I think I'm set to standard here, so I have this right here. So you can see there's a, a vertical asymptote in there at that 5, 6, but then there's a horizontal asymptote as well. Does anybody know where that horizontal asymptote is? Do you remember from last year at all? It comes up in the next chapter, but um, where, let me put this over here. Whenever the uh, numerator and denominator's exponent is the same, you take that highest exponent and divide them, the x's would cancel, and so 7 6 is where that is. And so what this is saying here is that y cannot equal 7, 6. There's a horizontal asymptote at 7, 6. So we would say for the range, negative infinity to 7, 6, and 7, 6 to infinity. I know this chapter kind of uh, focused more on the vertical asymptotes than the horizontal asymptotes. Okay. How could you get that without knowing that horizontal asymptote? Since you just found the inverse. What do you think? Right, find the domain of the inverse. Look at that denominator. 6x minus 7 cannot equal 0. And when you take and you solve, you actually get that value. So you can get it without knowing the horizontal asymptote. I personally use the horizontal asymptote because I know that, but um, that's how you would have to go about it. Because remember, the domain of this function, the inverse function, would be what the range is of this one. And then the range of this inverse would be the domain of the original. Okay? All right, the second question right here, you guys chose question number three, cotangent of secant inverse of x, um, and it says find an expression for this. And notice I am giving you something with an x here in all of these, so I'm not going to give you a number, is what I'm basically saying here. So that means you have to draw a triangle. So if this is theta, and this is my right angle, Secant. Hmm, you have to think of Sokotoa here, right? Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. But who is secant related to? Cosine. So we're going to here. Secant is hypotenuse over opposite, uh, adjacent. It's the opposite of that. All right, so that's saying when we have x over 1, this is the hypotenuse, this is the adjacent side. So there's the hypotenuse. The adjacent side would be this side over here. So then that leaves me to finding this side right here using Pythagorean theorem. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And then solve to get b by itself. So b squared is x squared minus 1. Take the square root. And now from there, finally, I'm asked to find cotangent. So cotangent of the angle, cotangent is the opposite of the tangent, so cotangent is adjacent over opposite. So adjacent over opposite would give me 1 over the square root of x minus 1. 
am I allowed to leave a square root in the denominator? No. So I multiply the top and bottom by the square root of x minus 1. And I get cotangent of theta is the square root of x minus 1 all over x minus 1. Questions on that one? You're looking at it strangely. Why did, oh, I just dropped it. You're right. That should be there. That should be an x squared minus 1 in there for all of those. I lost it. Okay. Can you take the square root of x squared minus 1? Then another question comes up. Remember, x squared minus 1 is x minus 1 times x plus 1. So you cannot take the square root of that. It stays with that square root over it. Okay. Next, number 3. Let's see. Or number 12, 12 I guess. Third one for today. Um, you guys chose number 27. It says, graph each function using transformations on an appropriate graph. Determine the domain, range, and asymptotes, if any. And then I threw in there, and the x-intercept is going to be asked as well on your test. And that's where your calculator is going to come in handy as well. All right, what I like to see in your work on the problem is you stating what are the transformations that are happening. Like what happens, what does it mean when it says x minus 1 moves to the right 1? What does it mean when there's a 2 multiplied out front? Mm -hmm. Vertical stretch of 2. So sometimes people don't know how I give partial credit. If you have the problem completely wrong and you don't have those things written down, at least for me, then I mark all the points off. So if the problem's worth 8 points, you get 8 points marked off. But if you have those types of things written down, and I can see that you wrote left one, and that's why your picture is wrong, then I'm going to give you partial credit, uh, quite a bit of partial credit, because you're telling me what you did. Okay? So anytime there's any sh type of transformation, whether it's translation, scale change, reflection even, if that's on there. Uh, I don't know if any of these, yeah, the first one there, number 25, has a reflection. You know, make sure you state those things. Okay? And be specific. Make sure you say vertical and, and not just stretch, because otherwise, what if it's a horizontal stretch? Okay. Now, what you could also do to help you here, because this is a calculator question, is you could graph it on your calculator. Okay. But some of you put things incorrectly in your calculator. Like, well, it seems like there was one on maybe the quiz. It, it, it was something I graded recently. Um, that it was something like ln of x and then like plus 1 like this. And so I had someone put it in their calculator, and w as soon as you hit ln, it gives you a left parenthesis. They never hit the right parenthesis. So instead of moving it up one, it moved it to the left one. And, you know, that those are calculator problems that sometimes people have that, you could mess up very easily on the calculator if you don't remember those parentheses right there. All right, so let's go back to our y equals here, and let's type this in to natural log, and then x minus 1, and then parentheses. And then let's graph it. Um, make sure you show me the vertical asymptotes and like that. Like the asymptote originally was the uh, y-axis. And it has moved to the right one. So you should be drawing that in when you draw your picture on your paper as well. You should be showing me that that vertical asymptote is right there. Okay. Those are questions that could come up throughout the year. Also remember that this thing is continuing to come down right here. Even though your calculator shows you it's stopping, it's just because it cannot draw a vertical line when it's in function mode. And at that point, it kind of looks like a vertical line because it runs out of pixels. Um, so you should have a graph something like this. But then next, we do need to find this point right here where it crosses the x-axis. All right, so going back to your calculator with that, we're going to go to calculate. So second trace there. And then it's called a zero. 
an x-intercept is called a zero. And then it says to pick a number to the left and a number to the right um, of it. So I don't know, I might pick, if I pick one, it could be an issue because there's an asymptote there. Let's pick it just to see. Okay, but if you would pick something like negative one, because it has to cross over an asymptote as it's looking, it, could, it will give you a problem with that. It could give us a problem with this one, in fact. So there's that one. And then from there, maybe over to three. And then go ahead and find it for me, please. And it's okay with it if you pick the asymptote, two, zero. So, oh, it did. I, I thought down here it looked like it was not at 2, 0. Yeah, it is. It looks like it was a little bit to the right of 2, 0. But 2, 0 is the x-intercept. So we need the domain. Well, the domain of this thing is going to be anything from 1 to infinity. Not including the 1. Notice there's a parenthesis and not a bracket there. The range of this thing goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. It keeps going up as it's going out, and of course it keeps going down. Uh, any asymptotes, so we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 1, and then of course the x-intercept is the point 2, 0. Okay. <laughs> Questions on that one? All right, next question. I asked you to choose three. You chose 58, 68, and 72. 58, 68, 72. Okay. Um, on question number 58, it is in exponential form, whereas the other ch two you chose are in logarithmic form. Since there is an x stuck up in the exponent of this, I need to try to get it out, and that's where logarithms come in. If I change it to logarithmic form, then I could take and solve it. So to change 58 to logarithmic form, do you remember that little story? I told you that was really dumb. Those two that are together get separated. And this guy comes to me. Okay. Then from there, log base 3 of 1. Well, anytime you have a log, no matter what the base of 1, what's the answer to it? Zero, right. What if you didn't know that? Could you use your calculator to find it, right? So let's make sure you remember how to use the log stuff on your calculator. Underneath alpha window here, alpha window number 5 is the log base. So if you didn't know that, you could have said log base 3 of 1, and it would have also told you 0. Okay, so just so that you have an out in case you don't remember that. Sometimes we're in the midst of a test, we, you know, our mind goes blank or whatever. All right, now from here, we have a quadratic equal to 0. You could either try to factor it. If you're good at factoring, you could use quadratic formula. But I'm going to factor for sure. X times X gives me X squared. Factors of 8 are either 8 times 1 or 2 times 4. And the 2 and the 4 would give me negative 6 if I did negative 2 and negative 4. I set them each equal to 0, and I get X equals 2 and X equals 4. Okay. Um, unlike questions 55, 56, 59, and 60, where the exponents are just x's and not x squared, there would only be one answer for those. Uh, but like 57, 58, those two there, they could have two answers because of the squared. Okay, so the exponent pretty much tells you that. All right, next, question number 68. All right, question 68, I have two separate logarithms, and I'd really rather have one logarithm. So what does subtraction change to if I want to write it as one logarithm. What is that? Division, right. So we could rewrite that as log base 3 of x plus 12 over x plus 4 equals 2. So I'm using my properties for logarithms. Addition changes to multiplication, 
subtraction changes to division. Now from here, I have some letters stuck in here with it in logarithmic form. So what I should do is change it to exponential form. So these two that are together get separated. And this guy comes between them. Well, 3 squared is 9. And now I have an algebra problem. Which again, I've got x's in both the numerator and denominator, so I try to get those out. So I take and I multiply by x plus 4 so that that cancels. On this side over here, I have 9x plus 36 equals x plus 12. And now move my x's to the same side, move my numbers to the other side. So I get 8x equals negative 24. Divide by 8, x is negative 3. Now, the one thing, because the problem started with logarithms and I got rid of the logarithm, I do have to check the answer and make sure that it's not giving me the log of a negative number. When I plug negative 3 in here, negative 3 plus 12 is 9, so we're good, positive. Negative 3 plus 4 is 1, it's good, it's positive, okay? But if I would plug that in, and maybe this was a 2, and it'd be negative 3 plus 2, and it'd be negative 1, I would have to say, sorry, there is no solution to this problem, because that answer ends up giving me a negative with a log. You cannot take the log of a negative number. Okay, but this answer works. Okay, it's a good answer. All right, and then finally, number 72, very similar to number 68 in that there is a subtraction. So I'm going to change it to division. So I have log base 3 of x squared minus x minus 6 over x minus 3 equals 1. From here, you could do, I guess, a couple of things. Um, maybe change it, follow the same steps, change it into exponential form. Um, it looks like something here might cancel as well, but if I don't reduce it here, it'll end up working itself out later. You know, So you kind of have options right there. There are two different things you could do there. Okay, I'll just follow what I did over here. These two that are together get separated. And that guy comes between them. I could follow exactly what I did over there, multiplying both sides by x minus 3. Getting rid of that. So I have 3x minus 9 equals x squared minus x minus 6. And then since it's a squared instead of to the first power here, I'm going to move everything to one side. So move both of these to the other side. And I get x squared minus 4x plus 5. And then I have some light factoring. Oh, that's plus 3, not plus 5 right there. And light factoring. Minus 3 minus 1. So x equals 1 and 3. But again, make sure you go back to the original and plug it in. If I plug a 1 in, I get 1 minus 1, which is 0, minus 6, which is negative 6. Uh-uh, I cannot have that guy. That guy I have to cancel. And then I plug the 3 in, and I get 9 minus 3 is 6, and 6 minus 6 is 0. Can you take the log of 0? The log of 0, that's where there's an asymptote, right? You think of that picture? So that one doesn't work either. So this particular problem, I consider this like one of the trick problems of these. It would be no solution. And here's what you want to remember about logarithms. The graph of a log... The graph of... Oh my goodness, let me start over again there. The graph of a logarithm comes up like this. It has an asymptote right here. So the domain of that is from 0 to infinity. It can equal 0, and it can't be anything in there. Your x can be negative, but when you plug it in, it can't be. 
All right, so those were three problems right there. Next one, this is like number 16. You guys chose 18 sub 1. You chose this first one right here. Suppose $15,000 is invested in a savings account paying 7% interest per year. Write a formula for the amount in the account after T years if the interest is compounded quarterly. All right. Oh, did we do one exactly like that? I don't feel like we did. I can't remember. We've done so many different things. Compounded quarterly isn't an annual kind of thing. Like what we talked about more than anything was y equals ab to the x. But this comes from this formula. The y equals is the same and the a is the same. But as soon as you're going to start changing interest uh, quarterly, monthly, daily, that kind of stuff, the formula changes a little bit. It's 1 plus r over um, n to the nt power. And this formula, you've had it, you've seen it many times before, and you started seeing it in Algebra 1, and then you saw it in Algebra 2, and you saw it in Pre-Calc, and here again in this class. And, and this is exactly what banks use if you have an account that earns interest quarterly, which many of you do. Many of the high school savings accounts earn interest quarterly. Um, as soon as you change to a checking account, it might be monthly. So it's just different. It's either quarterly or monthly for what you guys might have. Um, A is how much you start with, which is 15,000. R is the rate, but the rate has to be changed to a decimal. So instead of 7%, you'd say 0 0.07. N is the number of times in a year that the interest is calculated. So how many quarters are there in a year? How many quarters are there in a dollar? How many quarters are there in a basketball game or a football game, you know? It's, it's the same. It doesn't matter what it is. How many quarts are in a gallon? Like, that word is four, okay? It doesn't matter. It, it, they could, you know, change it up if they wanted to. And then N up here again is four. And then the T is how many years? T years. That's it. So the question is just write a formula for the amount in the account. So you could take and simplify this a little bit here, okay? And basically what you're doing then when you simplify that is changing it to a B value. So 1 plus 0 0.07 divided by 4. 1 plus 0 0.07 divided by 4. So that B value is 1.0175. So my equation... 1.00, uh -huh, I don't remember that number, 0175, 175 to the 4t power. Okay, so it's still an exponential equation of sorts, it's just a little more specific. Okay, very usable, that is used, at, you know, in your accounts all the time every quarter. You didn't have to do anything else with it on that one. You just had to set it up. Um, one thing you may decide, because you can see these problems are all a little bit different, like sometimes they're asking you for it. They're using the word compounded continuously. That is your PERT formula. Okay, and then this one's giving you the equation, which is kind of the PERT formula as well. And what is this last one? Compounded monthly. This one's like this one. It, it's just that um, instead of a 4, it's a 12. Okay. All right, number 17, number 104, you guys chose half-life. Plutonium-241 has a half-life of 13 years. A uh, laboratory purchased 10 grams of the substance but did not use it for two years. How much of the substance was left after two years? Okay, so that one is asking more of a question. This one, um, if we use our y equals ab to the x here, we're starting with 10 grams of the substance, so that's our a value. Now b, they said it has a half-life. 
as your time is broken up into 13 year increments. Okay, so that's like the formula you're going to use. But then they're saying that the time is two years later. So you could do a couple of things on this problem. You could take the y equals 10 times 1 half to the 1 13th power to the x if you want. There's going to be times they ask you different things with these, like as we move on throughout the year. But 0.5 to the 1 divided by 13 power is 0.948. So this is the same thing as 10 times 0.948 to the x power. So some of you are doing that on the quiz and then plugging your 2 in. But since they're not asking, like, part A, the formula here, and part B, you know, what, um, how much it would be, but didn't your take-home quiz, like, I'm pretty sure I have it separated into steps, like, give the formula, and then from there, use the formula. But if you plug the 2 into that right there, you have 10 um, times, and I'm going to say second answer here, just pulling that answer down, to the second power. And you get 8.9885, 8.99, we could say. So 10 times 0.948 to the second power is 0.899 grams. So that's how much I would have at the end of two years. Now, I do want to talk to you about something with this because this came up on the actual um, quiz. All right. So some of you on the, those problems on that very back side that were like the word problems like this and the next one, some of you, the year was the problem. Um, the year answer was supposed to be 2002. Some of you had 2003. Some of you had 2005, 6. And it all came down to did you use .948? Or did you use second answer with all the decimal places? You cannot round something and then use a rounded number in your calculation for your final answer. Okay? You need to use second answer on those as you're doing it. Okay? Um, and I can show you more on the next one because it has a part A, B, C, D, so I can show you a little bit better on that problem. But please remember... Like here, even though I wrote it as 0.948, like that's fine for an answer if they ask you for an equation, okay, or a formula. But as soon as you have to then put the 2 in and calculate something, it's not okay to use 0.848. So here's what I'm talking about. Last problem. Number 111, height and weight of NBA players. The table shows the roster of the National Basketball Association team Boston Celtics for 2012. So it gives their height in inches, it gives their weight in pounds. It says use a graphing utility to find the line of regression relating the variables x, the height, and y, and weight. Okay, so of course you're going to have a problem like this because these are problems that we did. I'm going to move this over to here just so that I can see it to go put it in my calculator. All right, stat and um, edit. If you have anything in here, remember arrow up, press clear arrow down. All right, so I'm going to put my values in here. There's 75, 80, 74, 84. I should have put these in before class so that I wouldn't have taken your time. 84, 79. You guys keep an eye, make sure that my calculator doesn't stutter at all here. Does anybody notice me put anything in wrong? Okay, next, 235. Make sure they're the same length. Perfect. So hopefully I got those in correct. 
go to stat, we go to calculate, we go to linear regression, which is number four. They are in list one and list two, so I'm good there. Right here is what you need to do to make sure that you get a correct answer for that final answer. I did not mark it off on your quiz because I wanted to make sure and have the discussion with you first, but on the test I will, okay? And that is, make sure you're saving this in your Y1 or Y2. Save it somewhere so that it's going to graph it for you, okay? All right, now, from here, this is going to take and give me the equation that I need for part A. So my equation for part A is y equals 7.45x minus 363.88. You cannot use that to get your final answer in part C. Okay, and that's where the mistake was. Some of you plugged in the next question into that right there. Those are rounded numbers, okay? My kids, 10 years ago, that's what they used, okay? Because they didn't have a calculator that would store it for them like that. They didn't have, it. like, you guys have a new operating system that allows for more preciseness, okay? And so um, I do expect you to use the graph on the calculator, okay? Next, use a graphing utility to plot the points and graph the regression line. And so that's the next thing I'm going to do. I'm going to go to my calculator, and I need to set the window, and I need to turn my plot on. So I have two things I have to do. So going to my window, I need to make sure I have these values right here. It's up to you if you start at negative 10 or if you start at oh, 60 or something, you know, a little closer. However you want, that's fine. Uh, but it looks like the heights go up to 84 so maybe let's go to 90. I'm going to do negative 10 to 90. And I'm going to go by 10. Okay, now my Y's look like they go up to 260 was the highest. So what if I do like uh, 100 to 300? And maybe go by 50 or something. 100, 300, like it. And then I also, so I could press graph there. All I'm going to get is the line. I'm not going to get my points because my plot is not turned on. And so I do need to take and go to my stat plot right there and turn that one on. Make sure it says from L1 and L2, which it does. So when I press graph now, there are my points and there is my line. Okay. Now I want to use this line right here for part C this here so it's there for later. It says use the line in part A to predict the weight of an NBA player whose height is 76 inches. All you do is you press second calculate, go to value, and type in your 76 inches. Okay, it's even easier than plugging it into the equation. It goes and it finds it for you right here. 292.12 right there. So the answer to that one is 292 approximately pounds. But let's look at if we would have plugged it into that equation. Okay, what if we plug 76 into that equation, just so that you can see it doesn't come out the same. I am not going to remember that. Hold on. 7.45 times 76 and then minus 363.88. It's going to come out something close, but it's not going to come out the same. All right, so if I go here to my regular screen and say 7.45 times 76, and then minus 363.88. Did I get it in there right? It comes out 202. Oh, did, did I not read that right? <laughs> it does say 202. That's just called old eyes right there. <laughs> so this is 202.11, 202.1. This one here, where is it? Came out to 202.32. So you see how it's not exactly the same? 
when it came with the years on the quiz, the take home quiz that you guys had, it was a difference of like five years for some of you. Depending on, did you give one decimal place? Did you give two decimal places? Did you give three decimal places? And that's why there was a fluctuation in answers, okay? So please make sure you use that part there. All right, so test day is tomorrow for day two, okay? You may use a calculator. So you saw we did use the calculator throughout the day today. 